Well, my name's Keely Fish, um, and I'm here to talk to you about Living Wild. All of you I know are in here because you are very modern. <laughs> and um, the thing about being modern is that sometimes it gets boring, sometimes it gets a little bit old. And um, I am Nanai. Um, I'm a descendant of the Nanai people and that come from the border of uh, Russia and China along the banks of the Amur River. Um, and uh, we are the largest indigenous group in Russia. Uh, but I'm also part of the smallest minority group in the United States. My family is the only Nanai family that lives in the U.S. And so I was raised in the U.S. I grew up here, um, but, and I was not raised traditionally. Fortunately, my grandma was not about to let that just pass. So again, so while my parents weren't looking, she was always telling me and my brother stories. They were always telling me a little bit of little stories that were kind of like sabotage which my parents were trying to teach me, which is, uh, and she was telling me the stories of big fish, of uh, our heroes, Nanai heroes who would ride on the backs of orcas, women that would turn into swans. And uh, so obviously me and my brother, we thought this was the best thing ever. And so wherever we got to, we got a chance to, we would ask my grandmother about what is the, just tell us a little bit more, you know? And then she would tell us about what life was like as a girl, little girl um, growing up in a, in a Nanai village, you know? And so I always wanted to go back and relearn what it was like to live as an indigenous person that's indigenous to the land, not just indigenous in culture, because that, that is really important, but the culture ultimately comes from the land, from the place that you're at, and from the flowers that grow, and the trees that grow there, and the fish that live there, you know? Um, so this presentation really is about the question, can someone modern, can modern people live and go back to being, to seeing through native eyes? Can any of us who are modern go back and see the world through native eyes? Um, all right, and so when I was 19, I met a very special person. Um, her name is Lynx Vilden. This is Lynx. She is a primitive skills expert. Um, the world of primitive skills is a very small one. <laughs> it's small, but um, also very, um, very critical. Um, she, <clears throat> she runs a program where she takes people out um, every year and gathers a, a global crew of people who come and they spend a year learning all the, all the skills of the Stone Age, of the Paleolithic. And they learn how to live, how to forget modernity and how to live again close to the land, learning the names of the plants, the birds, and how to take the hide off of a deer and turn it into clothing. Uh, and so obviously when I met her and she asked me to go out with her and spend a month in the wilderness living Stone Age, with indigenous technologies, I was like, yes, I have met the right person. <laughs> this is it. Um, and it worked out really well because uh, I was, uh, by that time, I'd already become a hunter and I was really interested in all this stuff. Um, so 15 years later, having become a photographer, um, I had been, I've been in primitive skills that whole time and then I decided, what the hell, I'm gonna go join Lynx again and I'm going to document, I'm gonna spend a summer with her and document what's going on um, with the project. Um, so here I am, a little younger, a little more fresh-faced. <laughs> um, but um, the summer of 2014, I went out with Lynx and um, the group, and um, basically they spend a year preparing. So for a six-week project, these people that are modern people, and they leave behind everything. So you can't take your glasses, you can't take, there's no coffee, there is no clothing. You don't wear, you don't get anything that you don't make from the natural world in that year using make with, made with stone tools. So even if you have clothes, you have to cut the hides with stone tools. You have to make the stone. You have to find the stone. The only thing you get to use your eyes and your hands. Um, all right. Um, and um, the interesting thing about the summer of 2014 was that um, here in Washington, which is where this project took place, it was in the North Cascades. And the North Cascades, um, at that time, had the biggest fires um, in North America. It's happened again this year. 
Um, but uh, the, the fires were huge and they were raging, and um, it was a constant struggle, a constant thing to think about, because where we were was encroached on all sides by wildfires. So we spent a large part of the summer running from wildfire, but not running with vehicles, running on foot away from wildfires. And so it was a really big deal. Um, and uh, it, was, it made everything that we did just a little bit more wild, a little bit more interesting. Um, when I showed up, I showed up after the first, um, after the year of preparation, and I wanted to take portraits of the group, of all these people that come from these different places. And uh, so here is uh, Neil, um, and um, I wanted to do these portraits in a way that you might take it and look at it as if Edward S. Curtis, the famous photographer of native peoples back at the turn of the 20th century, shot when he had a big view camera and was shooting people, and it was like, you know, it took four minutes or however long, a very long time for you to sit still very formally with your bow and your arrow and your kids and your otter pelts, you know, on your shoulder. And so um, I want them to dress in their primitive finery, all the stuff they've been making for a year. Because all the stuff that, they're, that Neil is wearing, the tip of that bow that you see, that buffalo hide, all of that stuff is stuff he's been making and working on and learning. He had to skin and eat and dry that buffalo meat for the project. And so I did these formal portraits um, in the woods with the black backdrop and then also in the environment. And uh, Emma here, you can see there's a lot of work that goes into the preparation. So there's um, a buffalo hide she's working on. Um, it's very labor intensive, it's tan a buffalo hide. Um, it takes about 200 hours to tan a buffalo hide, but that's no regular 200 hours of sitting in the office. That is 200 hours of you sweating and bleeding and busting holes in it and crying, and it is hard. It is very difficult, but she was amazing. <laughs> okay. And uh, Alex here, who had ridden before, he had to learn how to ride bareback because we didn't use primitive tack. Um, and we have people from all different ethnicities and ages um, and from all different countries. Claire on the right is German, um, and then I'm um, on the left. Uh, an Apache man. Um, so you have all kinds of people who are interested in this stuff, and it's, it's the kind of tip of the iceberg. This is a big movement that is happening, and it's not just happening here in the US, it's happening all over the developed world. Interesting. Um, okay. um, so the actual project itself going in, um, I like to think of primitive skills as uh, people a lot of times think of this kind of thing as survival. And it kind of is, and it kind of isn't. It's, a lot, it's not survival, it's thrival. It's about learning to live in a place for so long that it's your home. Not something to get away from, but something to be a part of. And so um, uh, here, um, we were taking um, up to 90 pound packs with us barefoot on the first day of the project and to go out and walk 20 miles up rocky trails. Um, so it's pretty difficult. And the thing about um, going out on a trip like this is that as a photographer, as a documentary photographer, sometimes it's about not just really, most of it's not about the actual photography. Um, I, no one can go out on a trip like this, or Lynx would certainly never let anyone go out, but you can't go out on a trip like this if you can't carry your own weight. And that's very literal <laughs> in this sense. But um, you, are, you have to be able to feed yourself. And not only feed yourself, you have to be able to take care of the people who are weaker, who don't have as much food. You have to be able to keep others from getting wounded or injured. You can't be a liability because out here, it's life and death. Every single thing that, every choice that someone makes is real serious repercussions. And so I was allowed to take a camera and a lens, uh, or several lenses, but no cases. Everything was made out of buckskin. Everything else, including lens cloths, everything had to be made of stone, from Stone Age uh, materials. So it, um, you have to make all these difficult choices, and one of them was leaving my bow and arrow at home, because I, if you are hunting, you are not shooting <laughs> with the camera. Okay. Uh, this trip involved horses a lot as well. Um, and so we went, we uh, had some very beautiful weather to the beginning of it. Um, the uh, interesting thing about this was that 
um, there's a little bit of romance in some of these images early on. We very, we, as we were starting out, the weather was beautiful. We had all these dried foodstuffs from a year's worth of drying and catching and all this. So everyone had like 20 pounds of food. It was no problem, you know, all dried up for the first little bit. And it's just like almost kind of perfectly idyllic, right? The flowers and sunshine. This is like what people think of when you think of like, oh, living um, in... in uh, a Paleolithic way. It's not, this is, I mean, that's the alternative to the caveman, <laughs> anyway. Um, but it's not always like that. Um, and uh, I would say that Stone Age living and primitive skills is 80% about the struggle. It really is. We, as modern people, even Lynx here, who looks so comfortable in her um, bark shelter here, who's been doing this for the majority of her life and lives this way full time, she reckons that she has about the knowledge of a nine-year-old indigenous person who grew up in that culture, right? So there's so much we don't know, and it's, we're so bad at all of these things. Um, so we require more material culture than usual. Um, and what you don't see, here is uh, Jesse in a buffalo hide sleeping bag. But what you don't see is that it is morning and she has not slept very much because um, there, the sleeping bag unfortunately lets in mosquitoes, and there's a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> um, and fires are by friction. <clears throat> um, I chose to go out with uh, the hunting parties. Um, it, the hunting is a, is a really important way to get food because it's protein and fat. Um, but going out with the hunting party is not so easy because when you're out there, I was out here with Lynx on, on this particular hunt, and um, the, uh, you, in order to get a good photograph of something that's going on like this, you have to be close, right? This is close and this is wide. And you want to see what's going on in her face and the expressions, and you want to be there in that moment. But at the same time, if the deer sees you, if a grouse sees you, or hears the shutter click, or sees the flash of a lens or the crack of you 10 feet behind the hunter, then 10 people might not eat for a week because of that. And so it's really, it, it was really important. A lot of this uh, ch ch documenting this project is actually not about um, the, the clicking of the, of the shutter. It's about getting around and being a part of that natural world, being part of that flow so that you forget, so that it's, you're so comfortable as part of it that the, the camera is a very easy thing to do. Um, and then I think that it's interesting to see that um, also this group just suffered some of the same things that indigenous people suffer everywhere. Um, the results of climate change from past wildfires that ravaged the region and, and basically destroyed habitat for game. So there's very little food here. Um, to be had, and this is something that you know we, you see it in the Arctic because of climate change. You see it here um, as well, but you don't notice it as modern people. We don't notice because we're insulated from it. But when you live primitively, these things are at the top of your. You I mean they, you are affected by them very, very much. Um, um, this is uh, one of my favorite, favorite photographs here, even though it's not so dramatic. I don't know if you can tell, but that little guy right there in the middle is a marmot. Uh, that marmot, um, it, looks like, uh, it looks like Neil has been holding that rock and is just about to drop it on there. But what's actually going on here is that Neil has been holding that rock for three hours. And I've been sitting about 20 yards away with my camera in my hand in the same position for three hours and we're not even there. We are not there anymore. We are part of the landscape. We've forgotten that we're there. We're, Neil, so focused on waiting for that marble to pop its head out and bring its body out that it, he is not thinking anymore. He's there. He's in the moment, and, his, and he is gone. He's paying attention to the wide world. His senses are so in tune, on alert, that he's listening to the birds around him, and he knows what's going on around him without looking. All these things, is, and what I love about this photograph is that this, it, to me, represents the transition. This is the moment in time when I first really started to see that all the layers of modern people, of modernity, are dropping off. He's like out of that world now, the world of smartphones and notifications. Like, his notifications are going on, but there, it's the symphony of the natural world going on that he's listening to. Um, and, yeah. 
So uh, grasshoppers, uh, sometimes we use them for bait, and sometimes we eat them. <laughs> um, they are really reliable. Um, but then even more reliable than that are things that can't run away from you, um, which is greens. Okay. Um, and then uh, <coughs> one of my fun experiences on this was uh, hopping on top of a horse and um, having never ridden before and uh, thinking, okay, well, I'm, it's time to take photographs. Um, we got to head back from our, tr from our trout fishing. Here, why don't you get on this horse bareback? Just put one hand on the mane and hold the camera with your other hand and hang on. And <clears throat> so 10 miles later, <laughs> I did actually manage to survive, didn't fall off the horse, um, and I didn't die of a heart attack, so it was amazing. I was really pleased with that. Um, so this project started as a personal project. Because it's very near and dear to me, um, it, this project eventually um, showed up in front of the director of photography at National Geographic and is now, a, is now under their guidance as a multi-year project. And so I will be going out with these guys to Arctic Sweden next year and following them around as we um, do a lot of paddling in icy waters. Um, and I wanna also wanted to show you guys um, that it's not all suffering. There's lots of joy and there's lots of human connection. The human connection here is really real. There's a lot, a lot of space for BS in when you, there's only six of you and you all depend on each other. You know, you kind of have to say things that are happening. Um, and uh, there are these moments when everyone comes together and then there's just spontaneous singing because it's sunny out. Uh, there are moments when people are just happy because they're alive. There's just no other reason. They're just like, it's kind of the same reason. Why does the robin sing? This is that reason. Now, I, my last question, though, is why is primitive skills not like LARPing, uh, which is live action role play? You've seen the people in the costumes and stuff. So um, I think uh, ultimately primitive skills is about looking back and understanding where we came from and what we evolved to be. Who, who did we evolve to be? Um, and why are we good at, uh, what things are we really good at to understand ourselves? Maya Angelou has the wonderful quote that uh, she, she said, we'll never understand where we're going if we don't know where we came from. And I think that's what exactly what primitive skills is about. Why is it important to document people running off into the middle of the wilderness? Um, and it's because we understand that because the people who do primitive skills are the keepers, the reinventors, the researchers, and the testers, these people who validate 100,000 years of human knowledge of which every single day we lose a huge portion of. Uh, every day, an elder dies and a culture disappears. And the people who are keeping it alive now are not just the cultures, and some of the indigenous cultures are keeping it as well, but this, is, this resurgence of people doing it is a wonderful, beautiful thing, and it helps us to understand who we are as human beings. Um, my favorite picture of uh, Lynx here, um, I think really represents to me the reason why people, I mean, well, people get involved with um, being outdoors for a ton of reasons. People get involved with primitive skills for any number of reasons. Um, but a lot of people just kind of dabble in it, you know, it's like, get interested, but why does anyone stay? Why does anyone stay in the wilderness? Why does anyone stay, go out to be dressed in animal skins and get, get rained on and bug eaten and then crawl out and do it all over again? Why would they want to stay that way? Why would they ever want to be hungry again? And I think that this picture for me encapsulates the reason why we do those things. Anyone who ever comes back, this is the reason why we do it. This is the reason why we go out there and get eaten by bugs. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm.